The ability to talk is a big part of what makes us human. There are more than 5,000 languages present in the world today. Without the ability to communicate with each other, much of what we see today wouldn't exist. Join me today on Ancient Yoke as we dive back in time to the roots of human communication and see just how it evolved into tens of thousands of different dialects. Enjoy. Before we get into today's video, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone that has stuck with the channel over the past year. We've recently just reached 1,000 subscribers. I appreciate each and every one of you. Even though a person who only speaks English can't communicate effectively with a person who speaks Mandarin, we can still communicate much better than other animals can. Communication between people doesn't just come down to speech. You can communicate that you are hungry, angry, tired, upset or scared with just your facial expressions, body language and hand signals. But it doesn't stop with just expressing emotion. You can even communicate with people to follow, help and even flirt. It's only when we come down to complex planning and conversation that we need to introduce language in order to effectively communicate. Even when using language, people often use body language and facial expression to accompany words. So in order to find out where and when language started being used, we must first start with the basic forms of communication amongst humans. The vast majority of animals have the ability to communicate in some form to members of their own species and even other species. But what makes early human communication different? Australopithecus, the first hominid to use tools, is commonly thought to have no language or speech abilities. However, communication was likely still important because they were social beings. They may have only been as vocal as modern chimpanzees. Chimps use hand gestures, body posture, facial expressions, and they make various noises. Chimps even have certain signs for danger which varies depending on how immediate the danger is. Vervet monkeys give different alarm calls when spotting different predators. Recordings of the alarms played back when predators were absent caused the monkeys to run into the trees for a leopard alarm, look up for eagle alarm, and look down for a snake alarm. This shows that recognizing and communicating in tone, pitch, and duration of sound is something that goes back tens and maybe even hundreds of millions of years. Lots of animals can communicate with sound, and we know that some animals even communicate with various sounds. But what about body language? Body language must be one of the most primitive forms of communication, probably behind smell, and is prevalent throughout the animal kingdom. Body language in the animal kingdom mostly conveys two types of emotion, fear and aggression. For example, rattlesnakes rattle their tail when feeling threatened and bulls show aggression by lowering their head and scratching the ground. Big cats will lower their entire body and then they will swish their tail back and forth rapidly. That brings us on to the next point. Although animals of all levels of social intelligence use some sort of body language to communicate, it is much more prevalent in more intelligent and sociable animals. Tails and ears are a massive way for lots of pack animals to communicate. Dogs, for example, are able to show more complex emotions than just fear and aggression with the use of their tails and ears. Tails that are directly erect or curved towards the body show signs of confidence and dominance. A tail that points straight out away from the body is a sign that the dog is being cautious and a tail down between the legs pointed towards the belly show that the dog is submissive. Other emotions dogs can express with their tail are being aware, confused, happy, excited, concerned and curious. We all know that wolves, chimpanzees and elephants are highly intelligent and sociable animals but perhaps the most fascinating and advanced social structures are found in the ocean However, it can be argued that the most complex and advanced social structures is that of ants, wasps, termites, and bees. Whale songs mean different things to different groups of whales. Depending on the species and specific group, songs can be signifiers of a range of relationships, including eligible males, family ties, social affiliations, and hunting styles. What makes whale songs so interesting to scientists is that songs are something whales learn from each other. 
and which evolve over time, like our own taste in music. Among the groups of whales studied, sperm whale dialects appear most stable. Gradual changes can be detected over years in killer whale dialects, while humpback whale songs can change completely in just one year. Judging just how advanced whale communication is still remains a mystery, but with the help of AI, scientists have started a project called Project CETI, which is the largest interspecies communication effort ever. We may not be the only animals on this spinning rock to possess an extremely complex form of communication. While marine biologists have long understood that dolphins communicate within their pods, new research which has been conducted on two captive dolphins is the first to link isolated signals to particular dolphins. The findings reveal that dolphins can string together sentences using a handful of words. The dolphins took turns in producing sentences and did not interrupt each other which gives us reason to believe that each of the dolphins listened to each other's pulse before producing their own. We've only deciphered the meaning of signature whistles. Dolphins use signature whistles in a way like our names to identify individual dolphins or groups of dolphins. Scientists studied a recording of communication between two bottlenose dolphins in separate enclosures connected by a system formed by a microphone and a speaker. They left the system turned on for long periods of time and recorded their communications. They found that dolphin's language is open and hierarchically organised, like our own. That means they can combine elements in different orders to produce different meanings. They combine elements in blocks of at least seven orders of hierarchical organisation. We combine phonemes to produce words, words to produce phrases, phrases into sentences, and sentences into paragraphs. That's hierarchical organization. Dolphins produce simple elements that are individual whistles or pulse sounds, and they combine them to form blocks of order. They combine first order blocks to form second order blocks, and so on. Stable blocks of up to seventh order of complexity have been evidenced. They can combine blocks of different order of complexity to produce an almost unlimited number of signals. Most of their signals are composed of 5 to 7 blocks, but they can produce signals with 2 to 24 blocks. A new study led by the University of Sassari in Italy has found that bottlenose dolphin signature whistles, which they use to identify one another, are strongly influenced by where they live and by the size of their local population. Although these whistles are unique to each individual animal, the experts discovered that their acoustic features are structured to a certain degree by dolphins' local habitat and communities, a phenomenon similar to the development of regional accents in humans. For instance, signature whistles in areas with seagrass such as Port Cross and Lampedusa were highly pitched and shorter in length compared to those of dolphins living in areas with muddy sea floors. Among small dolphin populations, like those from the Gulf of Corinth, the whistles had more changes in pitch than those of a larger population. These findings suggest that bottlenose dolphins develop signature whistles that are best suited to their local habitats. This topic is still being researched, so not all the facts have been laid out. I won't talk about all the evidence that dolphins possess a complex language similar to our own, but I'll link a study below so you can learn more. The oldest known human language is most likely one of the Khoisan languages, which is a group of languages that include clicking sounds. Most of these languages can be located in South Africa and is only spoken by roughly 1,000 people. One group of these people are the Khoikhoi, Khoi, a group of pastoralists that live in southwestern Africa. Another language that could be the oldest is the Hadzane language, used by the Hadza people of Tanzania. The Hadza are a tribe of hunter-gatherers that live in Tanzania and have been well documented recently on social media. Some tourists pay to witness the way of life of the Hadza and even accompany them on their famous baboon hunts. The Hadza's language is not considered part of the Khoisan group, although it was once considered so. These languages all contain clicking sounds. It is widely accepted that we, Homo sapiens, evolved in Africa. 
If this is true, then these languages may sound similar to the very first language spoken by our ancestors 200,000 to 300,000 years ago. We'll most likely never truly know what early language sounded like, but we can trace the oldest known written language back 5,000 years. Although this date is only based on what we have discovered, meaning written language could have appeared thousands of years earlier. The Sumerian language, followed closely by the ancient Egyptian language, is the oldest known written language and went extinct 4,000 years ago. Ancient Egyptian lasted until roughly 1,400 years ago. It was pushed out when the Arabs conquered Egypt. There has been suggestions that the first written language was actually found at Gobekli Tepe, which was built roughly 11,000 years ago, meaning that written language may be double the age that I mentioned previously. Gobekli Tepe is a prehistoric man-made megalithic hill site in today's southeast Turkey, which is riddled with walled, circular and rectangular enclosures lined by surrounding T-shaped monolithic pillars. On pillar 18 in enclosure D, a H is bracketed by two semicircles. An almost identical symbol appears as a logogram in the now extinct hieroglyphic language of the Bronze Age Luwians of Anatolia, and there it was the word for God. Further supporting a linguistic connection between Luwian hieroglyphics and the images at Gadetli Tepe are to date untranslated Luwian symbols resembling the T-shaped iconography of Gadetli Tepe and the H-like symbol which was the Luwian word for gate. Researchers conclude that the T-shaped pillars at Gobetli Tepe were in fact built and symbolically marked to represent a god, possibly a bull-associated being, which guarded the entry to the human and animal afterlife. Some researchers propose that this theme may have been inspired by real celestial images of then prevailing night skies, ritually reenacted and celebrated for centuries by hunter-gatherer pilgrims to this hill, and then spread by their descendants across Anatolia, still influencing language in the region spoken and written thousands of years later. If you want me to cover Gobetli Tepe in more detail, then put it in the comments below. Native Americans migrated via a land bridge into North America roughly 30,000 years ago. They migrated in three waves and spread throughout North America, Canada, Greenland and South America. Over a thousand known languages were spoken by various peoples in North and South America prior to the first contact with Europeans. These encounters occurred between the beginning of the 11th century and the end of the 15th century. Several indigenous cultures of the Americas had also developed their own writing systems, the best known being the Maya script. The effect of European settlement was disastrous for Native American languages and cultures. By the middle of the 20th century, roughly two-thirds of all indigenous American languages, including North, Central and South America, had died out or were on the brink of extinction. North of Mexico, it's estimated that roughly half of the Native American languages have become extinct, and of those still in use, more than half are spoken by fewer than 1,000 people. When Europeans first began to colonize the Americas, they brought diseases like smallpox and measles with them, as well as a settlement strategy that involved fighting and killing off Native Americans for their land. Their guns and horses gave them a major advantage, as did their immunity. Even the spread of disease, which is thought to have resulted in 75-90% to 90 of all native deaths, was not by mistake. The British officer, Sir Geoffrey Amherst, intentionally ordered his men to give blankets to the natives that came from quarantined areas or infected patients. After hundreds of years of battles, wars and atrocities, including the systematic state-sanctioned genocide of between 9,000 and 16,000 California natives from 1846 to 1873, the condition of the Native American population was a shell of its former self. It's estimated that between 1492 and 1900, the number of indigenous people living in US territory dwindled from 10 million to less than 300,000. The cause of the extinction of various indigenous languages was caused by more than purely murder. Surviving populations of Native Americans had been systematically removed from their ancestral lands. They were crowded into increasingly remote and limited parcels of land known as reservations. 
lasting through the early 20th century, they were also subjected to a program of forced cultural assimilation carried out through government-mandated boarding schools. At these schools, children were forbidden from speaking their tribal languages, wearing their tribal clothing, and observing native religions. In spite of everything, there are still approximately 150 North American languages spoken in the United States today by more than 350,000 people. That is according to the American Community Survey data collected from 2009 to 2013. That's out of 350 total spoken languages in the country. Though most of these languages are on the verge of dying out, some are holding on. The Navajo language, for instance, is the most spoken Native American language today, with nearly 170,000 speakers. The next most common is the Yopik, at 19,750, which is spoken in Alaska. However, the majority of Native Americans today speak only English. Of the roughly 2.7 million American Indians and Alaskan Natives counted in 2016, 73% of those aged 5 years or older speak only English. Areas of Canada speak French, North America speak mainly English, and the majority of South America speak Spanish and Portuguese. This is the result of colonizers wiping out the local culture and people and settling there with their own. Many African languages are wiped out or influenced heavily by English, French and Arabic. Wales, Scotland and Ireland's main languages are English, pushing their traditional Celtic language and culture further towards extinction. Australia and New Zealand are both English-speaking countries despite their native people living in near enough isolation until 1642, at which date the Europeans discovered them and began spreading their own influence. Another example of colonisation wiping out culture and language is in ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt had mounds of culture, their own religion, libraries, and language. The Library of Alexandria was accidentally burnt down by Julius Caesar's men, losing hundreds and maybe even thousands of years of history. The end of their religion was a result of the influence of Islam and Christianity. The death of the ancient Egyptian language started under Roman rule, when Egyptian priests were influenced into writing scrolls in Greek. The extinction of the language was after the Arab conquest of Egypt in 1641 AD. Egypt is now a Muslim country that speaks mainly Arabic. This shows us just how languages die out. Although there are preservation efforts for languages all over the world, the consequences of global colonization might be too much for some languages to survive. It's predicted that 90% of all languages will die in the next 100 years, leaving us with a mere 600 languages. Even further into the future is the possibility of all but one or two human languages becoming extinct. All the knowledge, culture and expression will be lost, just like many before. Most of the modern languages of today's world in Europe belong to the Indo-European language family. Just as French, Spanish and many other languages had descended from Latin, the Indo-European family of languages is believed to derive from Proto-Indo-European languages. The speaker of the Proto-Indo-European languages did not develop a writing system. That is why it is no longer spoken and we have no physical evidence of it. Indo-European languages have evolved into many branches, Celtic, Anatolian, Italic, Albanian, Indo-Iranian, Germanic, Balto-Slavic, Greek, and Armenian. The Yuxgara language is one of the oldest languages of Western Europe. It is the only living language of the old Indo-European languages, having survived for centuries on its own, while all others have gone extinct. It holds many mysteries, and its origin is still unknown. It was declared as a co-official language of the Basque County of Spain in 1979. There are around 750 native speakers. They are the last remnants of ancient Europe. The hunter-gatherers of Europe likely spoke a language that gave rise to Latin and Celtic languages, which then evolved into the languages we speak today. Latin evolved into Italian, Spanish and French. English, Dutch, German, Danish, Swedish, Icelandic and Norwegian came from the Germanic language. There were 16 Celtic languages, but now only Irish, Scottish, Breton, Cornish, and Welsh survive. 
Celtic language is slowly dying out as the majority of the population in Ireland, Wales and Scotland now speak only English. Welsh is the most popular surviving Celtic language in the world with roughly 650,000 people speaking it fluently worldwide, including small populations in Canada and Argentina. Language is beautiful and I love seeing how different people from around the world articulate words. If there's one thing I want people to take away from this video, it's that you shouldn't look at language as a barrier or something that separates people, but something that makes us human and brings us together.